2009 is the 400th anniversary of Galileo's use of a telescope to make observations of the night sky, a scientific advancement that forever changed our understandings of human relationships with the cosmos. The anniversary is being celebrated through a United Nations designated International Year of Astronomy. As part of the global celebrations, many countries are celebrating Aboriginal knowledges of astronomy alongside mainstream science's understandings. Aboriginal astronomy is embedded in night sky stories and many such stories can be found across Canada. They are rich components of First Nations, Inuit and Métis cultural heritages. Muin the Mi'kmaq night sky story of the celestial bear. This image, entitled Reflections, is by Mi'kmaq artist Gerald Glode. It illustrates the Mi'kmaq understanding that everything that happens in the sky is connected with what takes place on Earth. Another way of saying this is that patterns on Earth are reflected in patterns in the sky. Night sky stories are told to transmit these rich understandings generation after generation. Canada has 15 terrestrial ecozones. Each ecozone has its own natural patterns. For example, the kinds or abundances of trees, plants, and animals. Because of this, the different ecozones create different experiences for humans living in them and different stories have emerged to connect patterns on Earth with the star patterns overhead. Also important to note is that at different latitudes on Earth, different stars will be visible in the night sky for those humans living below. This too will result in richness and diversity in the night sky stories across Canada. This story is based on the Mi'kmaq night sky story, Muin, the Celestial Bear. In times gone by, the Mi'kmaq people openly shared this story with visitors, likely while they all sat around fires in the Mi'kmaq communities scattered across Nova Scotia. One such visitor was Stansbury Hagar, an anthropologist who wrote down the story of Muin and published it in 1900 in the Journal of American Folklore. Unfortunately, no specific Mi'kmaq individuals or Mi'kmaq communities are named in the article. This story has been brought back to life by Elder Lillian Marshall from the Mi'kmaq community of Budalodek, also known as Chapel Island, in Cape Breton, Nova Scotia. She worked in conjunction with Elder Merdina Marshall from the Mi'kmaq community of Eskazoni in Cape Breton and the presentation was prepared by Sena Kavanagh of Cape Breton University. Muin and the Seven Bird Hunters is a very old legend told by Mi'kmaq for generations. The story is told in the present tense because it is always happening. This presentation is dedicated to the elders of Mi'kmaq. Mi'kmaq is the traditional territory of the Mi'kmaq people in Eastern North America. These elders wish us to understand that the stars are the time givers. They are the calendar. In Muin and the Seven Bird Hunters, there are many characters. Muin, the black bear, is the most common bear in North America and occurs in all Canadian provinces with the exception of Prince Edward Island. Jipjawage is the robin. Robins are very common birds in the territory of Mi'kmaq and they are familiar to all people because they are easily identified by their red breasts. Jigigase, chickadee, is a small bird. Chickadees live in family groups and members of the family are constantly talking to each other. Most of us are familiar with the chatter of a chickadee dee dee or a jigigay in this story, Jigigays carries a birch bark pot known as Wo in Mi'kmaq. Mik'jagohwej is the gray jay. 
He is also known as Moose Bird by the Mi'kmaq people. Very territorial birds, gray jays are remarkable in that they nest very early in the spring and are already sitting on their eggs by March. Belez is the passenger pigeon. These birds were once very plentiful in Mi'kma'ki, feeding on acorns from oak trees and nuts from beech trees. Sadly, passenger pigeons are now extinct. This is due to the overharvesting of oak and beech trees, as well as Belez being overhunted by non-native people who thought Mother Earth's resources were limitless. Next is Didias, the blue jay. Noisier than their gray jay cousins, blue jays are not very territorial. The splash of their bright blue bodies is immediately apparent and they are seen frequently throughout the territory of Mi'kma'ki. Gugugues is the barred owl. Living in deciduous forests, barred owls live throughout the land of the Mi'kmaq people. They find abundant small animals to hunt, and they are able to provide for themselves throughout the winter. Finally, there's little Gupguage, the northern Sawat owl. These smaller owls, with their variety of calls, are interesting in that some winters they are able to stay in their homeland of Mi'kma'ki, and in other winters they need to fly further south to find enough food for the winter. These seven birds are known as Nduksuinuk, the hunters. Here are their Mi'kmaq names. and their English names. It is a great gift that Hagar, in his published article, identified the stars in the Mi'kmaq legend by their Mi'kmaq as well as their Arabic names. Because he did this, it has been possible to get the birds to settle down in the sky and take their correct place in the story. This connection between the birds of the story and the specific stars might otherwise have been lost. It is also important to realize that these birds are how the Mi'kmaq people identified the stars. Different patterns on Earth result in different reflections in the night sky. In this way, different cultures may see different characters and different stories in the sky. The stars in this story include those within three constellations named by the ancient Greeks. There are seven stars known to many of us as the Big Dipper within Ursa Major. These seven stars make up the hind end of Muin and the first three bird hunters. The remaining four bird hunters are stars in the constellation of Boodies the herdsman, and the bear's den is the constellation Corona Borealis. The Arabic names of the stars of the seven bird hunters are Alioth, Robin, Mizar, Chickadee, who carries a birch bark pot, Alcor, Alkaid, Grey Jay, Sejinus, Passenger Pigeon, Izar, Blue Jay, Arcturus, the Barred Owl, and Mufrid, the Northern Sawat Owl. The story of Muin and the Seven Bird Hunters is happening throughout the year and is visible to us in the Northern Hemisphere while looking up into the North Sky. The story evolves in the sky as the bear and the bird hunters move through the seasons around the star, known by the Mi'kmaq as Dadabun, the North Star, or Polaris. Modern astronomers call stars that move around Dadabun 
circumpolar stars. Because this story progresses day after day, the Mi'kmaq storytellers chose to tell it as they see it in the sky two hours before dawn. In order to see this story, we too must look two hours before dawn. Because stars are the time givers or calendar, this night sky story is a story of the changing seasons and the events that occur in these seasons. Muin and the seven bird hunters move around Dadabun. To give an overview of the pattern of the story, as seen in the northern sky two hours before dawn, here is Muin and the seven bird hunters in spring. Summer. Autumn. And winter. One complete revolution of Muin and the seven bird hunters, plus just less than one degree, happens each day as the earth makes one full rotation on her axis. Although, of course, we can't see the stars during the daylight hours, but we can see them two hours before dawn, which is when we see the greater pattern of the yearly progress of the story in the sky. The Mi'kmaq night sky story of the celestial bear. Late in the spring, when the sun awakens the sleeping earth, Muin, the black bear, wakes for a long winter sleep. She leaves her rocky hillside den and descends to the ground in search of food. Instantly, sharp-eyed chickadee perceives her and, picking up his birch bark pot, he calls other hunters to help. Jibjawich, Robin, sees Muin. Next, Mikjawosh, Grey Jay, sees Muin. Then Bliss, the passenger pigeon. And Didius, Blue Jay. Then Gugmukwis, the bird owl. And, last of all, little Gupwich, the Sawan Owl. All the birds see the wind and is stirred after her. They are Nuktuk Suminuk, the hunters. The little chickadee with its precious birch bark pot is placed between the larger birds, Robin and Grey Jay. All the hunters are hungry for meat after the short rations of winter, and so they eagerly give chase. But throughout the summer, the bear flees across the northern horizon, and so the chase continues. In the autumn, one by one, the hunters in the rear begin to lose the trail of the hunt. This is reflected in the night sky by particular stars disappearing below the horizon. First of all, the two owls, barred owl and sawwood, who are heavier than the other birds, disappear from the chase. Next, blue jay and pigeon lose the trail and drop out of the chase. This leaves only robin, chickadee, and gray jay. The hunters who are always hunting, they continue the pursuit. And at last, about mid-autumn, they gain on their prey. Knowing she is caught, Moin rears up her hind legs and prepares to defend herself. But, Robin shoots her with an arrow. Moin dies and her life spirit leaves her body. Now Robin is very thin in this season. 
and is eager to eat some of bear's fat as soon as possible. He leaps upon Muin and becomes covered with blood. He flies to a close maple tree in the sky and tries to shake off this blood. He manages in getting all of it off except one red spot upon his breast. But the blood which he shakes off splatters far and wide over the large forest of the earth below. And that is why each autumn we see the blood red color on the leaves. It is reddest on the maples because trees on earth follow the appearance of the trees in the sky and the sky maple received most of the blood. The sky is just the same as the earth, only up above and older. A short time after these things happened to Robin, Chickadee arrives on the sea. He sees the red on Robin's chest. That spot, says the Chickadee, you will carry as long as your name is Robin. Robin and Chickadee cut up the bear, build a fire, and play some of the meat over it to cook. Slowly, after all the work is done, Gray Jay appears. He had almost lost the trail, and when he found it again, he had not hurried, because he knew that it would take his companion some time to cook the meat after the bear was killed and he did not mind missing that part of the work, so as long as he arrived in time for a full share of the food. Indeed, he was so taken with this idea that ever since then he had ceased to hunt for himself, preferring to follow other hunters and share their spoils. And so whenever a bear or a moose or other animal is killed today in the woods of the you will see Gray Jay appear to demand his share. That is why the birds named him Mik Chahokoch, he who comes in at the last moment. And the Mi'kmaq say there are some men who ought to be called that too. However, that may be. Robin and Chickadee, being generous, are willing to share their food with Gray Jay. The hunters prepare for a feast. Before they eat though, Robin and Gray Jay, in great thanks, dance around the fire. Such was the custom when the Mi'kmaq were brothers and sisters to all and shared their food together and thanked each other in the universal spirit for their present happiness. Chickadee stirs the pot hunters have a feast. In winter, Moon lies on her back. You must not laugh when you hear Ukwish, the saw wet owl, and you must not imitate his rasping cry. For the Mi'kmaq say that if you disrespect him, you can be sure that wherever you are, as soon as you fall asleep, he will descend from the sky with a birch bark torch and set fire to whatever clothing covers you. We go back to the book. 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 We go back to the Tanko <laughs> I'll be able to get a little bit of a 
The Mi'kmaq Midwinter Ceremony is held after the new moon in January and is the most important ceremony of the year. It is a time to give thanks to all spirits, especially the Great Spirit for the blessings of life, health and sustenance, and for the privileges of community living. It is also a time for healing ceremonies by the medicine men and women. The midwinter ceremony marks the end of the year past and the beginning of the new. It occurs year after year. But the story of Muin does not end here, though one might think so. Through the winter, her skeleton lies upon his bed in the sky, but her life spirit has now entered another bear, who also lies upon her bed in the den, invisible and sleeping the winter sleep. And so it is, the Mi'kmaq say, that when a bear lies on her back within her den, she is invisible even to those who might enter the den. Only a hunter gifted with great magic power could perceive her then. When the spring comes around again, Muin once more leaves her den to be again pursued by the hunters to be again slain and send life spirit once more to the dead. And so the story happens eternally. Life goes from generation to generation. There is no end. So, to return to the theme of patterns in the sky, reflecting patterns on earth, we see how the Mi'kmaq people saw much meaning in the movement of the stars and how they interpreted this movement in their telling of the story of Muin and the Seven Bird Hunters. This type of pattern-based understanding is the basis of all scientific knowledge regardless of the culture. Again, we remind ourselves that different cultures see different patterns in the sky and different stories. Here, we can see how the bear's den is made up of the constellation known to the ancient Greeks as Corona Borealis. If we look in more detail, we note that the size of the birds in the story directly relates to the apparent size of the star to the naked eye. In more detail still, we see that the Mi'kmaq star watchers were able to differentiate between the small Mizar, known as Chickadee in the story, and the star Alcor. Alcor seemingly sits directly on top of Mizar, which the story describes as being Chickadee's precious birch bark pot. Is there more to this story yet? Ancient Mi'kmaq petroglyphs from Kejimakujik National Park in mainland Nova Scotia reveal the figure referred to as Star Husband. Fitting neatly over the constellation of Budis, matching up with the Corona Borealis, is he Unduk Suinu, the Great Hunter? forever hunting Muin across the northern sky? This story is about just one part of the night sky. The Mi'kmaq people have many more rich stories for other parts of the night sky. The Mi'kmaq Nation encourages other Aboriginal people across Canada to reconnect with their night sky stories as part of the celebration of International Year of Astronomy 2009. It is important that all Aboriginal children feel connected to the night sky and that such efforts continue as legacies long after the International Year of Astronomy is over. The Mi'kmaq Nation also hopes to help awaken all people to the richness of understandings within Indigenous sciences across Canada and around the world.